For the past century, literary theorists have asked readers to downplay the role of authors of works of fiction. Why? We know that in minimizing authors, they have departed from most of us who love reading fiction and are curious about the author. So much so that biographies of authors are a popular genre of books. But as Elizabeth Winkler has observed, the death of the author meant the birth of the literary theorist. Literary theories are faddish emphases on one or another popular topic among academics, which usually have little impact on amateur lovers of fiction. Similarly, literary theorists have downplayed the importance of fictional characters, sometimes claiming they are nothing more than words on the page without an inner world or backstory. But why do we care about them enough to read fiction? Further, why has there been such a profound disconnect for the past several decades between general readers' reactions to fictional characters and those of many literary theorists? In the 2021 New York Review of Books, Evan Kindley of Pomona College wrote, readers love fictional characters almost as if they were real people. Literary scholars are just starting to take them more seriously. That essay tapped into long-standing concerns I have had about the direction that literary theory has taken, downplaying the roles of actual writers and readers of fiction. Prevailing literary theories, however misguided, may remain entrenched, partly because of the considerable power of groupthink. Literary scholars may unconsciously preserve their solidarity as a group by agreeing not to question certain core assumptions, including the role of the author, and instead attack those who do question them. What motivates this minimization of authors and of their characters? Unconsciously, it may be one means by which literary scholars attempt to stake their exclusive claim on interpreting the text. They may feel some rivalry with non-specialist readers who productively engage with the text through their own subjectivities. I will propose that an unwillingness to believe that Shakespeare's bisexual sonnets are autobiographical is a pivotal, if unacknowledged, reason that literary theory has subsequently turned away from the author and from the psychic reality of literature. That's a bold claim, I realize, but I will try to offer evidence for it. Both Homer and Hesiod regarded poetry as divinely inspired, so the person who merely channeled it was of little importance. Socrates agreed and offered as evidence Tinicus of Chalcis, a mediocre poet who wrote only a single great poem. That Socrates' claim showed the gods chose him to prove, prove it was they who spoke through the great poets. So Homer, Hesiod, and Socrates anticipated our modern literary theorists in devaluing the role of the author. In 1769, Robert Wood proposed that Homer was illiterate and his works were handed down orally. Scholars now agree with Wood since Homer probably lived during the era when ancient Greece had lost knowledge of writing. These assumptions in turn influenced the bardolatry that promoted similar views of the divine but uneducated genius Shakespeare starting that very year of 1769 with the so-called Stratford Jubilee promoted by the famed Shakespeare actor, David Garrick. By the late 18th century, many intellectuals had lost their traditional faith in God. So rather than view Shakespeare as divinely inspired, they instead began unconsciously regarding Shakespeare as a surrogate deity. When did literary theorists begin trying to impose their own opinions about authors and their characters on the general public? One prominent, especially transparent example was T.S. Eliot, who contended in his 1923 essay, The Function of Criticism, that a primary purpose of literary criticism is the, quote, correction of taste. Note the timing just three years after J. Thomas Looney's book, Shakespeare Identified, offered compelling evidence that the Earl of Oxford wrote Shakespeare's works under a pen name. And Eliot apparently disagreed with the ancient Latin maxim that one cannot argue about taste, de gustibus, known as disputandum. My central claim is that minimizing the role of the author and doubts about the status of fictional characters are closely but covertly related to the Shakespeare authorship debate. What exactly are these doubts? 
A central tenet of literary theory for many years has been that we should focus solely on the text, not the life or psychology of the author. We are not allowed to speculate about fictional characters' psychology or backstory. Every time I have asked Shakespearean actors and directors about the backstory of their characters, they have looked uncomfortable. They usually reply that all we have is the text and backstories are not needed. Occasionally, actors do create a backstory for their character, but they keep it private. Shakespeare scholar Gil Harris contends that all major movements in literary theory are reactions to Shakespeare's works. However, the appealing but appallingly flawed legend that William Shakespeare of Stratford wrote the greatest literary works in the English language has poisoned literary theory, downplaying the role of the author in what he writes. Yes, uneducated people often achieve greatness, but that fact is woefully inadequate as evidence that Shakespeare, whom no contemporary identified as a writer, wrote Shakespeare. And no, all those Elizabethan references to Shakespeare are in all likelihood allusions to a pen name, not to the merchant whose name was spelled differently. Shakespeare scholars invariably assume otherwise, a sign of just how shaky their ostensibly 100% proven authorship theory really is. In 1917, the Stratfordian Gordon Cross, citing Emerson's admission that he could not marry Shakespeare's life to his verse, wrote that the known facts of Shakespeare's life make it very unlikely that he was the author. So, lacking any biographical facts that would link Shakespeare to the literary works, literary scholars poured over Shakespeare's sonnets for autobiographical clues. For reasons I will explore a bit later, they then drew back in horror from what they found and insisted defensively that these highly personal bisexual poems must have no connection with the life or character of the poet. This anti-intellectual view of the author lives on when Shakespeare fans and scholars insist, it makes no difference who the author was, it's the plays that matter. Harvard Marjorie Garber said this to Elizabeth Winkler. We see the birth of modern literary theory in Sir Sidney Lee's dubious but confident conclusion that the obligation to draw on Shakespeare's personal experiences for his theme or its development was little greater in his sonnets than in his dramas. Lee claimed great literature comes from the imagination alone. Lee was thus contradicting centuries of scholarly and common sense understanding of the, com of the fascinatingly complex connections between a given work of literature and the life of its author. An important but widely overlooked example is Dante's 1294, La Vita Nuova, in which this canonical author explains in great detail the connections between his early poetry and his life and psychology. Understanding what has gone wrong with literary theory means looking at the psychology of Lee and of other literary theorists who have a blind spot for the pivotal influence on their field of the hopeless mismatch between the works of Shakespeare and their ostensible author. In this presentation, I trace this misguided repudiation of the role of the author to a homophobic reaction to the bisexuality of Shakespeare as reflected in his bisexual sonnets. Those who claim absolute certainty that Shakespeare of Stratford wrote the works of Shakespeare utterly ignore the prevalence of anonymous Elizabethan authorship and the related possibility that Shakespeare was a pen name. They claim that those they label as authorship heretics don't know how to evaluate evidence, while they ignore all the abundant evidence that their theory is mistaken, and while they cherry pick random facts that create a rickety foundation for their beliefs, or invent creative interpretations for facts that don't quite fit. A close examination of their accusations against heretics reveals abundant further examples of projection. J. Thomas Looney began his authorship research in the years leading up to 1920 with an exemplary and novel methodology. Without preconceptions as to the identity of the real Shakespeare, he compiled from the plays and poems a list of some 18 characteristics of the author. Note that Looney did not follow the contention of subsequent literary theory that the author is irrelevant to understanding the text. Instead, he knew that the text can reveal the fingerprints of its author through careful examination. Looney thus saw the author's creation 
in intrinsically psychodynamic terms, an artistic embodiment of real conflicts that can be documented in Oxford's life. So Looney made use of inductive reasoning, a Renaissance innovation that avoids reasoning deductively from an unquestioned premise. Nor did Looney get led astray by confirmation bias, which is the glaring defect of traditional Shakespeare biographies. For example, since they assume Shakespeare could not possibly be a pen name, they then assume he attended grammar school, for which there is no evidence, and that he knew how to read and write, which most of the English population at the time could not do. Looney's 1920 book seems to have had the unintended effect of inspiring Shakespeare scholars to construct new theories of literature that downplay the role of the author and draw attention away from possible connections between literary characters and real people. This trend eventually led to new criticism, insisting on a laser focus on the text alone and to the hyperbolic death of the author movement. A pernicious false binary was offered, claiming that Shakespeare and other great writers used their imagination, not actual life experiences, to create their fictions. Writers themselves, however, make it abundantly clear that it's not either or. In reality, genius, imagination, and life experiences all contribute to the cauldron of creativity. More than 70 years ago, Ogburn and Ogburn astutely observed, the conventional attribution of the works of Shakespeare has corrupted the judgment and insight of generations. It has misled us as to the whole nature of artistic creation. Solely on the strength of the example Shakespeare has been supposed to afford, we have been prone to believe that the artist may be no more than a pipeline between a source of divine inspiration and a pad of paper. Shakespeare scholars have engaged in a desperate and maladaptive effort to ignore the overwhelming evidence offered by Looney and instead to construct theories that made Looney's discoveries irrelevant. In the process, literary theory also sidelined common sense and alienated itself from the perspectives of non-specialist lovers of literature. Now some general comments on the psychological power that fictional characters can exert on us. I include this here because characters have been downplayed along with their authors by literary theory. We should never underestimate the so-called primacy effect and lifelong influence of our earliest introduction to fiction from the stories our caretakers read to us when we were toddlers and young children. Neonates display special interest in stories that were read to them in utero. I fondly remember the Oz series of books that my mother read to my brother and me, not in utero, but at bedtime. I recently reminded my brother, who is two years older than me, that I vividly recall my envy when he learned to read and no longer needed to wait until bedtime, since he could now read these Oz books on his own. The books offered a Narnia wardrobe-like doorway into the vast, exciting world of the imagination, which is a natural home for children and needs to remain a healthy aspect of all adults. Many adult lovers of fiction now prefer to listen to audiobooks, recreating the childhood experience of being read too. Fiction helps nourish our imagination. We enjoy literature because we use the pretend mode we learned in childhood to treat fictional characters as having psychic reality for us. Eric Erickson's epigenetic model of development emphasizes that who we were as children at different ages remains more or less hidden aspects of our adult identity or of our various adult self-states, to borrow Philip Bromberg's helpful theory. As Hal Jensen put it, our older and younger selves collide in the books we reread. Shakespeare was masterful in addressing all aspects of our adult and still active childhood self-states as well as our conscious and unconscious identity. His late romances such as The Tempest have important elements of children's fairy tales. It may come as a surprise to many of you that there is any debate about the salience of the role of the author in the fiction she writes. A bedrock of the psychoanalytic view of the mind is the theory of psychic determinism, which observes that elements of life history, character, conscious motivation, and unconscious conflicts and fantasies inevitably shape all aspects of adult behavior, including the writing of literature. Anything can be taken to extreme, of course, and excessive uses or one or another psychotic theory played a role in the backlash against the application of that theory to literature. 
In his review of a recent book by John Guillory, Stefan Collini observes that by the early 20th century, universities were influenced by the growth of professions and those who taught in universities had to conform to the professional mode, basing their authority on command of specialized forms of knowledge. The question, however, was whether literary studies possessed such a mode. For Guillory, the pivotal development in the whole story was the arrival of criticism as the dominant approach of the 1920s and 30s. But criticism never quite shook off the aspiration to be in some way the criticism of society, not just literature, saddling the activity with exaggerated ambition still evident today. Noting the anxiety and defensiveness that criticism's never wholly successful claim to professional status has generated, Guillory links this to the grossly exaggerated justifications that tend to be offered for academic literary studies. Most English professors seem to write primarily for their colleagues, not for general readers. Yet works of literature belong to us all and are read by a much broader range of people than the tiny fraction who are English professors. Joshua Pugh observes that treating characters like real people is perhaps the biggest taboo in literary studies. In an online discussion of this topic among Shakespeareans a couple of years ago, one scholar reprimanded those who treat Shakespeare's characters as having an inner life and a backstory, arguing instead that they are nothing more than ink on the page. Another emphasized the words and actions of characters as offering our only certain knowledge of them, cautioning against inferring their inner lives. In 1933, L.C. Knights attempted to rebut A.C. Bradley's influential psychological study of Shakespeare's characters, and Knights' subsequent influence has been profound. Knights mocked the character criticism that began in the 18th century when Knight said, an inability to appreciate the Elizabethan idiom and a consequent inability to discuss Shakespeare's plays as poetry led critics to focus instead on his characters. But Knights insisted on narrowing the focus to the quote, words on the page, which it is the main business of the critic to examine. Why was Knight's essay so influential? Probably because a mere 13 years earlier, Looney had exposed the fatal flaws of the traditional Shakespeare authorship theory. Knight's insistence on focusing on the text alone acted synergistically with new criticism, which favored close reading at the expense of looking at the author's relationship with her literary creation. It is as though there has been an unconscious displacement from erasing characters to erasing authors. The author most in need of being erased was, of course, the real Shakespeare, the 17th Earl of Oxford. What would Oxford himself say about this debate? Perhaps, let us on your imaginary forces work. Those words from the prologue of Henry V imply that a Shakespeare play only comes to life in interactions among the actors and the audience. An audience member who regards the play as merely words on the page will struggle to allow her imagination to breathe new life into the plays. But she could learn something valuable from children whose imaginary play tells us something important about play and plays. As children grow older, it is unfortunate if they feel they need to jettison their younger, more imagination and rich self-states, like now superfluous stages of a rocket. The transition is noteworthy. My then five-year-old daughter once asked me timidly, Daddy, are there really such things as clowns or only people who dress up like clowns? What would you say? I was blown away by her question and uncertain how to answer. Years later, when her five-year-old daughter got into a serious conversation with me about whether the Easter bunny is real or imaginary, I told her just how valuable our imagination is our entire lives. I'd had time to think about her mother's question in the meantime. And what of Shakespeare's sonnets? One of our finest sonnet scholars, Harvard's Helen Vendler, calls the sonnets the largest tract of relatively unexamined Shakespearean lines left open to scrutiny. She observes that they are lyric poems, the most personal poetic genre. Freud viewed the sonnets as self-confessions. They have received far less scholarly attention than Shakespeare's plays. Why? They were omitted entirely from the 1623 first edition of Shakespeare's collected plays. First published in 1609, five years after Oxford's death, they were apparently so controversial 
that it wasn't until 1640 that most of them were reprinted in John Benson's edition that downplayed their bisexuality with added titles implying nearly all of them were addressed to a woman. For example, he used the generic title, Self-Flattery of Her Beauty, for three of the sonnets written to a young man. Our earliest commentary on the sonnets was a handwritten note at the end of one of the surviving 1609 first editions. What a heap of wretched infidel stuff! As recently as 1929, the sonnets were banned in New Zealand. The sonnets' neglect reflects the impossibility of connecting them with their traditional author. Even today, many people who love Shakespeare's works remain unaware of the bisexuality of these sonnets. A minister confided to me that he had often recited Sonnet 116, Let Me Not to the Marriage of True Minds, when offering, when officiating at heterosexual weddings, unaware that it is a poem about a gay relationship. Likewise, scholarly criticism of his bisexual sonnets is fatally flawed by the insistence that these highly personal poems have no connection with the author's life, and especially no connection with his sexual orientation. Hamlet is thought to be Shakespeare's most autobiographical play. Marjorie Garber singles out Hamlet as being especially true to life. And Sidney Lee pointed out that Hamlet has words and phrases such as quietus and my prophetic soul that are shared only with the sonnets, emphasizing contrary to Lee's anti-biographical reading, just how personal they both are. In his essay on the sonnets, Elsie Knight's says their order is mostly arbitrary, and he is adamantly against any biographical reading of them, which guarantees we will not fully understand them. Twelve of the sonnets were copied in personal commonplace books during the early 1600s. Unlike other poems found in such collections, the poet is never named. The gender of the beloved young man was often changed. Robert Giroux joined many scholars in assuming the fair youth was the Earl of Southampton, 23 years younger than the Earl of Oxford. Giroux surveyed plentiful evidence of Southampton's bisexuality. He thought Southampton suppressed the 1609 first edition of the sonnets to prevent the wider public from learning of his youthful affair with Shakespeare. Similarly, it was only in the 19th century that we learned from the bisexual scholar John Addington Simmons that 30 of Michelangelo's love poems were written for the much younger nobleman, Tommaso da Cavalieri. When Michelangelo's great nephew published their first edition in 1623, same year as the first folio, he changed the beloved into a woman. Most Shakespeare scholars agree that the fair youth of the first 128 sonnets was the Earl of Southampton, since Shakespeare dedicated his two long poems to him in 1593 and 1594. The conventional assumption is that Southampton was Shakespeare's patron. Unfortunately, there is not a shred of evidence to support that hypothesis. By contrast, we know that Southampton grew up in the same household as Oxford, as another of Lord Burley's noble wards, after his father died when Southampton was only eight. Given how little is known about Shakespeare of Stratford that illuminates his ostensible plays and poems, Lee and other early scholars read his sonnets closely, looking for autobiographical clues. Although the sonnets as lyric poems should naturally be expected to be extremely personal, and given that their author does not seem to have authorized their first publication in 1609, the story they told was so offensive to many readers that scholars came up with alternative, far-fetched interpretations. The sonnet's bisexuality was a major stumbling block. The first 126 sonnets are the best in the collection, and they were written to a younger man. The next 28 poems to the dark lady reflect a love-hate relationship, jealousy, and a sexual obsession. And now, at long last, my central claim. Sir Sidney Lee, one of the 19th and early 20th century's foremost Shakespeare scholars, wrote in August of 1898 in the London edition of the Dictionary of National Biography. In the sonnets, Shakespeare avows the experience of his own heart. Then, shockingly, just four months later, in the New York edition of that same work, Lee reversed himself and wrote that the sonnets created only, quote, the illusion of personal confession. This unacknowledged and unexplained about face 
seems to have been the origin of the biographical fallacy dogma that then took hold, as literary theorists told us it is improper to look for connections between a literary work and its author. Psychoanalysts know that, on the contrary, it is all but impossible for a creative writer to completely disconnect themselves from their literary creations. Naturally, there is a wide spectrum of possibilities, from strictly factual autobiography to purely imaginary fiction. Lee didn't even acknowledge that he changed his mind. So what was he trying to hide? Schiffer believes that Lee's, quote, change on the issue of autobiography was clearly prompted by a desire to wash clean Shakespeare's good name. A few years later, in 1905, Lee wrote, a literal interpretation of the sonnets credits the poet with a moral instability, which is at variance with the tone of all the rest of his work and is rendered barely admissible by his contemporary reputation for honesty. A purely literal interpretation of the impassioned protestations of affection for a lovely boy, which course through the sonnets, casts a slur on the dignity of the poet's name, which scarcely bears discussion. A friendship of the healthy, manly type, not his plays alone, but the imaginary records of his biography, I added that word imaginary, give fine and touching examples. We see here the collision between Lee's objectivity and his wish to idealize Shakespeare. In more recent years, we have all had the opportunity to expand our sphere of empathy, to include those who have previously faced bigotry and exclusion, including gays and bisexuals. In 1933, L.P. Smith wrote sarcastically in direct disagreement with Lee, the story Shakespeare recounts in his sonnets of his moral, or rather his immoral predicament between these two loves, must certainly in the interest of the British Empire be smothered up. The business of proving and reproving that our Shakespeare cannot possibly mean what he so frankly tells us has become almost a national industry. It is no exaggeration to conclude that in Lee's reversal on the autobiographical nature of the sonnets, we see the birth or rather the miscarriage of modern literary theory. Lee possibly conflicted about his own concealed homosexuality which was a criminal offense in his native Britain until 1967, had to reject a bisexual Shakespeare. Lee also tried to conceal his Jewish identity, changing his first name from Solomon to Sidney. Suppression of controversial aspects of identity thus extended from Lee's own life to that of Shakespeare. We see here the pivotal role of the psychology of the literary scholar. Alan Bell and Catherine Duncan Jones, in their Oxford Dictionary of National Biography entry on Sidney Lee, comment in detail on the evolution of Lee's public statements about the sonnets. They are astutely perceptive about the role of Lee's psychological conflicts and his hasty and lifelong retreat from his August 1898 recognition that the sonnets are autobiographical. Evading the possibility that Lee himself was a closeted gay man they speculate that he never married because he was too busy with his work. They quote him as saying in his first essay on Shakespeare that Shakespeare's relations with men and women of the court involved him at, at the outset in emotional conflicts which form the subject matter of his sonnets. They speculate that Lee had reached the reluctant conclusion that it was not prudent for an ambitious man of letters to promulgate an image of England's national poet as emotionally devoted to a young nobleman. His abrupt withdrawal from any literal meaning of sonnets 1 to 126 may have been a delayed response to the trial and imprisonment of Oscar Wilde. Just three years before Lee's second encyclopedia article on Shakespeare, in 1895, Wilde had cited Shakespeare in his own defense against Lord Queensberry's public description of him as a sodomite explicitly equating his own then criminal relationship with Lord Alfred Douglas with the love celebrated in Shakespeare's sonnets. Much of Lee's extensive ensuing study of French and Italian Renaissance poetry, especially the sonnet, seems to have been informed by an almost desperate determination to discover models there for Shakespeare's purely literary devotion to a young male patron. It must have rattled Lee to learn in 1893 that Michelangelo's sonnets were also gay love poems, and that like the 1640 edition of Shakespeare's sonnets, they had previously been disguised as heterosexual love poems. In 
Only recently have some mainstream scholars such as Sir Stanley Wells and Paul Edmondson concluded that the sonnet's author was probably bisexual. Wells and Edmondson did so when they came out of the closet themselves as partners. Once again, what does not fit with Shakespeare of Stratford, the Stratford merchant, fits perfectly with what we know about Oxford. Evidence suggests that he was indeed bisexual. Homoerotic relationships are a theme not only in the sonnets, but also in several plays, such as the relationship between Antonio and Bassanio and the Merchant of Venice. Now, literary theorists on literary characters. I once asked the fiction writer and reviewer Alan Chews, who had a PhD in comp lit, what role literary theory played in his writing. None, he replied. He is scarcely the only writer to rebel against the limitations of literary theory. Hermione Lee, a distinguished biographer, studied English literature at Oxford and disagreed with efforts to disconnect literary works from their authors. So much so that she left academics in order to pen biographies of great writers, including Edith Wharton and Virginia Woolf, repeatedly showing connections between their lives and their works, duh. Similarly, Deidre Baer was in graduate school in English and comp lit at Columbia when she told her advisor she wanted to write about biographical aspects of Samuel Beckett's fiction. Her advisor told her that would be academic suicide. In critical theory obsessed academia in the 1950s, 70s, biography was not seen as serious scholarship. In 1817, William Hazlitt observed, quote, Hamlet is a name, his speeches are but the idle coinage of the poet's brain. What then, are they not real? Their reality is in the reader. It is we who are Hamlet. The psychoanalytic literary scholar Norman Holland agreed with past scholars that literary characters have a degree of psychic reality for readers. Discussing Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, he wrote, the proper place to apply psychoanalytic techniques is to the real minds of the audience. Part of that real response of the audience is to the fictional characters and events as though they were real. Hence, to apply psycholytic techniques to the character's mind is, in fact, to apply them to the audience. Holland then confessed, I have violated the most basic rule that all self-respecting new critics follow. Do not go beyond the words on the page. It is impossible to overstate the importance of the plays and poems of Shakespeare for any discussion of literary theory, including our views on the status of dramatic, poetic, and other fictional characters, and especially the significance of identifying who the real author was. Shakespeare has been widely praised for centuries for the unique, unique verisimilitude of his characters. Wilhelm Schlegel, for example, wrote in 1809, never perhaps was there so comprehensive a talent for the delineation of characters as Shakespeare's. His human characters have not only such depth and precision and are inexhaustible, this Prometheus not merely forms men, he opens the gates to the magical world of spirits. We are lost in astonishment at seeing the extraordinary, the wonderful, and the unheard of in such intimate nearness. He gives us the history of minds. One thinks of contemporary literary theorists claiming fictional characters are merely words on a page when we read Hazlitt's acerbic critique of the 18th century critic Samuel Johnson. He would be for making criticism a kind of Procrustes bed of genius, where he might cut down imagination to matter of fact, regulate the passions according to reason, and translate the whole into logical diagrams and rhetorical declamation. As Looney's authorship theory became better known, Shakespeare scholars reacted as though it constituted a dire threat to the implicitly faith-based nature of their authorship theory. Instead of bothering to examine the impressive evidence Looney had presented, they instead ridiculed his amusing name, among other ad hominem attacks on Looney and his followers. As I've mentioned, by 1933, just 13 years after Looney's book appeared, L.C. Knights began the influential tradition of deriding anyone who treated Shakespeare's characters as anything other than imaginary creations it became as unacceptable to speculate about their psychology or their backstory as it was to speculate about, about connections between the literary work and its author. Berkeley's professor of comp lit, Robert Halter, is concerned that peculiar things have clearly been happening in the academic study of literature. 
This book, his The Pleasures of Reading, is in part a response to that tide of peculiarity. He refers to fashionable absurdities in criticism. He writes that he has been shocked to discover that literature faculties may be increasingly populated with scholars who don't particularly care for literature. Further, what is more pertinent to the disturbing prospect of the disappearance of reading is that the language of literary criticism now often reflects an emotional alienation from the imaginative life of the text under discussion. Given his stature and the seriousness of his allegations, it is disappointing that Alter's critique seems to have had so little impact. Literary theorists probably don't particularly care for his book. Alter says he makes no attempt to deal with the roots of the literary work and the psychology of the writer or the reader's own psychology in reaction to the work, though these seem to me compelling questions that have so far eluded satisfactory answers. He eloquently calls fiction that mere artifice that ensconces itself in the inner sanctum of our imagination. And he points out that few people read unless they can somehow identify with the characters live with them inwardly as though they were real. Alter compares writing with psychoanalysis. It is as if the very process of writing allowed the writer to tap unguessed levels of his own self to achieve a kind of non-volitional heightening of ordinary insight as analogously the process of free association in psychoanalysis is supposed to do. Alter shows that not all literary scholars have joined the death of the author cult. Might authors of fiction have something to offer on our topic? Indeed, but their views are not always well represented in academic discourse on this matter, ironically. And it constitutes too vast a subject for me to do more than merely touch on it here. Naturally, some writers insist their fiction has nothing to do with real life. This stance may offer them the privacy and freedom they need to write. According to Adam Watt in the novel Time Regained, Marcel Proust characterizes the entire creative work as a sort of optical instrument, which allows its readers better to understand themselves and the world they live in. And it remains a lens that can clarify and sharpen our vision of our own highly mutable and troubling world. At one extreme, some writers seem to have adopted the personas of their fictional characters, Alfred Jarry sometimes seemed to merge with his obnoxious character, Père Ubu, in his real life. Helen Emily Woods changed her name to Anna Kavan, who was a character in two of her previous novels. Her fiction then became much more experimental than when she wrote under her previous name. The Portuguese poet Fernando Pessoa confided to a friend that his dozens of pseudonyms were utterly real to him, so he called them heteronyms. In fact, he said their identities seemed more real to him than his own, and that he felt he was merely the empty stage his characters lived on. The respected novelist Anne Lamott wrote, you need to find out as much as possible about the inner life of the people, fictional characters, you are working with. Whatever your characters do or say will be born out of who they are, so you need to set out to get to know each one as well as possible. One way to do this is to look within your own heart at the different facets of your personality. Go into each of these people and try to capture how each one feels, thinks, talks, survives, what I would call self-states. Graham Greene said, writing is a form of therapy. Sometimes I wonder how all these people who do not write can manage to escape the madness, melancholia, the panic and fear, which is inherent in the human situation. Nobel Prize winner J.M. Coetzee said, in a larger sense, all writing is autobiography. Everything that you write, including criticism and fiction, writes you as you write it. And Samuel Butler observed that every man's work is always a portrait of himself. Readers enjoy reading fiction because of their capacity to resonate with the imaginative power of the author. Psychologists sometimes assess clients with projective testing such as the Rorschach test. Reactions to an ambiguous stimulus, such as an ink blot, can reveal a great deal about the client's inner world. And the writer's blank piece of paper or computer screen is such an ambiguous stimulus for the writer. Conclusions. Nothing explains everything, 
Shakespeare constantly invites us to appreciate complexity. Many of us who love reading literature are puzzled by the disconnect between our subjective assumptions about it and those of literary theorists who reject common sense understanding of the vital role of the author and of the interaction between our imagination and fictional characters. In an effort to shed further light on this profound disjuncture, I've explored some of its likely origins in the misguided efforts to connect the literary works of Shakespeare with the Stratford merchant Shakespeare. If there is a single moment when literary scholars began to pivot away from the reading public, it was in 1898 when Sidney Lee felt compelled to abandon his recognition that Shakespeare's sonnets are autobiographical. Disturbed by their blatant bisexuality, he denied that such poetry reflected the poet's inner life and instead turned to an intellectualized effort to create a cover story involving literary illusion. We still hear echoes of his influence when people who love Shakespeare react to doubts about who the real Shakespeare actually was by claiming, it makes no difference, it does. So where does this leave literary theory? Let us hope that Evan Kidney was correct, and it is nearing the end of its long, pointless detour away from common sense. Departments of English, like the humanities in general, are under threat in universities from declining student enrollments. They might once again return to their former popularity if scholars would begin speaking to students and to general readers about our shared reasons for loving literature and wanting to know more about the lives of real authors.